Hello there everyone, UXW Bill here with you once again. Today, I have to tell you all that I did kind of a bad thing. You see, I had a rush computer repair job come in, someone who needs the machine up just as soon as I can get it there, and as such, instead of ordering computer parts through the regular online outlets, where there are certainly better prices and more fine-grained selection, I went to a Best Buy store in order to get the particular part that I needed. While I was at that particular Best Buy store, I noticed that the aisle in which I was shopping was butted up right against the Geek Squad department. Now ordinarily I wouldn't go near the Geek Squad with a 10 foot pole because heaven knows I've spent plenty of time over the years cleaning up a lot of the messes they have made in the name of allegedly fixing people's computers. And while I certainly hate to offend anyone or speak ill of any particular group, well, I've never seen anyone competent that works at the Geek Squad. I suppose it's like the Loch Ness Monster. It probably exists, but nobody can prove it. <laughs> right next to the Geek Squad were a couple of shopping carts full of sad-looking derelict CRT monitors, no doubt waiting for certain doom in the form of electronics recycling. They definitely weren't anything worth grabbing. They were pretty banged up, and it looked like they'd done a lot of long and hard hours. But in another cart, I found this thing. This is a Dell Inspiron 7500 laptop, and I have to tell you, as stupid and cheesy as it sounds, I didn't have the heart to leave it there to get recycled, because whoever owned this machine took absolutely phenomenal care of it. This machine was ordered as per its Dell service tag sometime in the year 2000, making it 15 years old. And I'm sure many of you can effortlessly visualize what a 15-year-old laptop should look like. This one somehow has escaped all of that. I kid you not, it is like time has stopped. It's not too surprising that there aren't any heavy scratches or signs of wear on the top cover, that the keyboard keys are in good shape. It's a little more surprising that the touchpad doesn't have any obvious sign of wear or smoothness on it. But rather remarkably, perhaps even inexplicably, the bottom of this computer is absolutely flawless. All the rubber pads are here and accounted for. They've only managed to pick up a little bit of the dust and fur that's present on this heavily abused pool table turned video studio and electronics repair workbench. That brushes right off. There's, there's not a scratch on this machine. It's, it's just unbelievable. There's no dust on it. There's... Well, there's nothing. It'd almost make you wonder if anybody ever actually happened to use it. Now, at first I thought about trying to do the right thing, taking the machine up to the Geek Squad desk, seeing if maybe they'd let me have it if I was willing to surrender the hard drive to them. But then I decided to do something, shall we say, rather ballsy. I guess you could say my inner Robin Hood came out. And while perhaps it can be very validly argued that my inner Robin Hood should have waited for a better moment. I have this sickness as concerns vintage computers, even computers like this that really are not old enough to be worth anything. You know, you'd think if I was going to get in trouble for having done something wrong in my life, that I would try to make it something that was morally or ethically in a, in, in a way that I would be unquestionably right. Or if it couldn't be any of those things, that someone would say, well, that was at least a worthwhile cause that Bill got in trouble for. <laughs> As opposed to trying to swipe a derelict computer from the Best Buy recycling department. That's exactly what I did. I put the thing under my arm, and I proceeded to walk up to the cash register with my purchases, and if anyone ever saw me do it, they never said a word. When I got up to the cashier and paid for the item I had purchased, I told a little lie. Yes, I know, I'm probably heading for an extended stay in the sin bin when my natural life has concluded. But it shouldn't be a huge problem, because I'm probably going to be so darn busy shaking hands with friends, I won't have time to worry about having landed in hell. <laughs> I told the cashier that I brought in my old laptop and couldn't find a power supply for it. She didn't say a thing. Nobody hassled me on the way out. Couldn't believe my luck when I climbed in my truck and drove off. Now I know that they have security cameras recording there and it's entirely possible that the next time I venture in, if anyone has ever thought of it, that they might question me about it. But I don't go to Best Buy terribly often, so 
I'm really not particularly worried. And now that you've heard my entire life story, and no doubt some clever little commentard who thinks they're a big deal because they're on Mommy and Daddy's computer will undoubtedly take me to task over it, well, I think it's time to take the camcorder off the tripod, if I'm actually smart enough to do so, and have an overview of this machine. We'll also have a power-up test just to see what it does, because one thing that can be said for certain about nice-looking old laptops is they might be nice-looking because they exhibited strange behavior or problems very early in their life and were therefore shelved and saved the rigors of further use. That's something to think about if you're planning to go against the advice of UXW Bill and actually buy yourself a used laptop. Laptops are so cheap today that I really don't think there's much of a case to be made for it, although old desktops can certainly be worthwhile on the second-hand market, especially those that are refurbished with contemporary operating systems. But enough of that. Let's go ahead and take a look at this machine, have a quick overview, a kind of a tour. You can see that whoever owned this machine, well, they obviously went for the big dollar because it's got a DVD-ROM drive on it. Not a CD burner, not anything like that. And I don't know that you could have gotten a combination drive on this particular machine, but that couldn't have been cheap in the early 2000s. Well, the year 2000, as a matter of fact. And then directly underneath that, we have not only a floppy drive, but some of you may have recognized the marking on the drive shutter already. This is an LS120 drive. It reads and writes conventional floppy disks, just as a normal drive would. And it also works with specialized magnetic format media that can store, as the name would suggest, 120 megabytes, less some shipping, gouging, and content settling during shipping and gouging <laughs> along the way. Although these drives gained enough traction that I did see them used in generic white box personal computers and even some laptops of the time, I've never actually seen the media for one of these. I haven't even seen it turn up in the in the secondhand market like a, excuse me, like I do with floppy diskettes from time to time. Seems like I'd better have a drink of water. <laughs> Got a frog in my throat. <laughs> And there we go. That's a million times better. Moving right along from the optical and floppy drives in this machine, we have the display latch, which is a little counterintuitive, I found. It actually moves over to the side instead of pushing inward, and you have to hold it in while you open up the display. So it definitely takes a few fingers to pull that particular concept off. Sitting right underneath the display latch are three indicator lights, Presumably one for power, one for hard drive, and definitely one for low battery. And speaking of the battery, the battery is sitting right next door. I would imagine it's hopelessly dead at this point. So in order to power up this machine, I will actually have to find my Dell PA6 series adapter. I know it's down here somewhere in the computer mess room. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is not the computer mess room. This is Fortress of Amplitude room. Get it right, Bill. <laughs> but I'll have to find it. And I'm not sure where it is since I organized everything in here. That's just about my kind of luck, you know. <laughs> so let's take a look at the display panel. You can see here that it's basically flawless. There's a little bit of a mark here, but I wouldn't call that a scratch or anything along those lines. It looks just like maybe some some dust or residue left over from cleaning, something along those lines. But take a look at this keyboard. There's, there's no wear on any of the keycaps. Their slightly textured surface is still completely intact, and although there is some dust between the keys and in the substrate layer of the keyboard, there's not very much of it. There's the trackpad. Again, a little bit of dust on it, mostly from the fact that this is a dusty old house but no signs of wear, not even on the click buttons. Both of which work perfectly well. They're not, they're not um, depressed or uneven or spongy or anything along those lines. So let's go ahead and turn this thing on the side. Hopefully I won't bang the display into anything and tear it up. <laughs> There's an opening for ventilation and near that heat pipe and radiator assembly you can actually see the only real concentration of dust in this particular machine. There's a conventional telephone modem over here, and underneath that, not only surprising to not only is it surprising to see this on a laptop, it's surprising that they chose to put it under the modem connection. It's actually a reset button in case this thing locks up. And it's not too unusual to see those on older laptops like 
early model, late model, 486 machines, even some early Pentiums, but a Pentium 3 laptop such as this, well that's definitely kind of surprising. And then there is the nearly ubiquitous Kensington lock uh, socket, where you can plug in a lock if you have one to keep this machine from wandering off. Here on the back panel, we have the other side of the heat pipe and radiator assembly. There's actually a fan in there. Again, some dust, but it's surprisingly clean. It'll be interesting to see if it actually works. And, of course, we have a full card of ports on the back of this computer. I'm sure that the Dell Inspiron line was pretty much targeted to the home market from the outset, but it certainly wasn't as cheap as it is today, and it wasn't as cheap as it became by the time that the Pentium 4 era Inspiron laptops hit the market, and unfortunately a lot of those ended up frying themselves to death. We have a printer port, we have a serial port, VGA output, a staple on laptops, a television output, and this is actually a combination connector. It carries more than one signal format. You want, I almost wanted to say television format when I was talking about this, but television format can refer not only to the actual picture and color encoding, but also the method by which the signal is delivered. And I'm sure that this thing is capable of both NTSC and PAL output. So there are a number of signal formats represented by this connector. There is conventional S-Video, there will be composite, and there might even be component as well. I'm not sure if there are enough pins for that. And the early 2000s was certainly early days for component video output on all but the highest end pieces of audio and visual equipment. And then right next to the television output is a connector for a docking station. Certainly a fixture that you would not see on the later cheaper Inspiron products. But there is one here, although I've never seen it and have no idea what it looks like. A little bit surprising for a laptop from 2000, but it has a USB port. There's just the one, that's all there is, because USB peripherals were still pretty thin on the ground, but this machine could handle them without any add-on cards as long as you were happy with uh, USB 1.1 speeds. And then sitting right next to that, there is a combined keyboard and mouse connector. Ordinarily, you can connect just one. It's also possible to get a splitter, as IBM sometimes included with their ThinkPad computers back in the day, so that you can hook up both an external keyboard and mouse. Likewise, if you had the docking station or the port replicator, you could hook up a keyboard and mouse at the same time with no special adapters other than the docking station or the port replicator. And then there is something that you also won't see on a lot of modern computers, the infrared data exchange port. Infrared data exchange used to be fairly popular with things like personal digital assistants and certain other portable computing devices. It was so popular at one point that some desktop computers actually came with infrared ports built in. A good example of such a thing is this Hewlett Packard Vectra over here, which while it doesn't have the port, you can see that it has the plastic plug in the front panel. I actually do have one of those machines, a fancier model, that implements the built-in infrared functionality and it works perfectly well under Windows 98 on that machine. Let's go ahead and turn this on its side, take a look at some of the side ports, and also take a look at some rather curious design decisions on the part of Dell. You've probably noticed this already as I was going through the ports on the back of the machine, but there's kind of a lip that overhangs the back. And I'm not sure this was really something that their designers thought through as best as they could, because it seems like this would be an unfortunate victim of the kind of accidents that often befall laptop computers with protruding parts. But here on the side we have the power adapter input, one of those three pin style connectors, we have the various audio I.O. connections, and actual hardware volume control. What a nice and surprising touch to see on a fairly budget-oriented machine such as this. Also surprising to see on a budget-oriented machine are not just one, but two PCM CIA, probably card bus capable by this point, expansion slots. So this laptop has got it all, including an opening for a tiny speaker that probably isn't very high fidelity, but we shall see. Speaking of things that we shall see, I'm confident that this machine's battery is completely hosed. I mean, what 15-year-old laptop battery wouldn't be? But just because it's in such amazing shape, I'm going to try it. Let's push the power button and see what happens. 
I, I don't think anything will happen. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, uh, I think I've just witnessed a miracle here. <laughs> we have a dual speed Pentium 3 processor. IBM Travel Star hard drive. 12 gigabytes in size. The floppy drive is disabled for some reason. Most of the kind of options that you would expect to see in here, like an NTSC television output. You probably also choose PAL, as mentioned previously. I don't know about the time, but the date is certainly right. There's a service tag, an encouragement from Dell to visit their website. Although, as previously noted, well, I think I said something about it. No, I mentioned the service tag, at least briefly, but I didn't talk about what made the service tag so very interesting on this particular machine, and that was the lack of any hardware configuration information. It's like maybe someone at Dell wasn't um, doing the best job at maintaining database integrity over the years. I wasn't too surprised when the service tag on that old Dell 486 back there didn't turn up any configuration information, because let's face it, it's been at least 25 years since that system was manufactured. If not, it's very close to. But this one, this one's almost modern by comparison. Part of me doesn't really want to believe that the year 2000 was 15 years ago. <laughs> Makes me feel old. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and see what's listed in the, uh, in the system devices roster. I will almost certainly have to wipe the hard drive on this. I'm sure that no one thought to do it, so that will have to be done. That That is just absolutely not optional. Someone did customize the parallel port's mode of operation. Dell usually had these things default to the bi-directional, also called the IBM PS2 mode, so maybe someone was actually using the parallel port on this machine, and of course the modem is installed. Although the floppy drive itself is disabled, the floppy drive controller is enabled. So maybe the floppy drive doesn't work, who knows. Security, no passwords have been set, thankfully, because there's no way in the world I could ever call Dell and tell them this is my computer. <laughs> Power management mode is customized. This was actually one of those setup utilities that still let you govern a great deal of what happened for older operating systems that weren't ACPI aware. You could choose things like the suspend mode as save to RAM or save to disk. We'll just leave that set the way it is because Windows 2000 and later all have the capability to optionally hibernate to a file and then power off. And then of course there is Intel speed step support. Now this was very early days for speed step. So as you saw in this thing sign on screen after I hit the setup entry key it only toggled between 700, what was it, 750, 700 and 550, I think. It's amazing, all the old crap that I can remember about these computers from when they were new, but I can't even tell you what I saw 30 seconds ago on the post screen. There's the list of boot devices. There's the exit option. I'd like to figure out how to enable the floppy drive, but I don't, I don't readily see a way of doing that. It looks like you can only choose to enable the controller or disable it. So let's go ahead and exit setup. I, I just I just have to see what this thing will do. Actually, I'm going to turn it off, and then I will start it over again. And we can watch it boot up together. That is, if it's not going to ignore the power button like a boss, which apparently it is, because it's in setup, and hey, dummy, you're not supposed to be turning the power off right now. There was something else I wanted to point out about this particular machine's hardware design. I said turn off. <laughs> Obviously it's not listening to me. Okay, there it went. Now it's off. I had noticed this when I was looking around the front panel prior to making this video. You'll notice that the optical drive and the LS120 drive are both stacked one on top of the other. And I'm greatly curious if both of those bays are modular in nature. All right, after a brief detour, I am back. These big, high-capacity infolithium batteries are really nice, but even they reach their point of rundown sooner or later, especially when you've got this camcorder light on. I don't know how it is that the three LED light on these camcorders runs through the battery so stinking fast because the infrared light emitting diodes for night shots certainly don't and they seem to be driven every bit as hard as the visible ones if not a great deal harder besides. Getting back to the laptop though 
I went ahead and pulled the drive assembly out of the multi-bay and that's exactly what it is. The LS120 drive and the DVD-ROM are both ganged together into one assembly. It doesn't look like there's any way that they're intended to come apart, at least not in the casual usage sense. There's just the one data connector, looks like maybe some fingers for power over here. Something along those lines. So I guess if one of these fails, Dell had to replace the whole assembly. And this is what the multi-bay unit itself looks like. You can see the connector at the back there for the data connection on the drive. You can also see what's probably the power connector if it isn't so dark that it gets lost in the video compression process. And you can see a set of connection fingers for a second battery. So this machine was really pretty deluxe. So deluxe, in fact, that it looks like it's got... I thought that was a cooling fan, but maybe that's some kind of a woofer assembly. A wannabe woofer for sure, but a woofer nevertheless. We'll have to play some sounds on this thing and find out. But first we have to put the multi-bay unit back in, which clicks into place rather nicely. And then we'll power it up. I'm still, I'm still just amazed that that battery actually seems to work. <laughs> what, what are the odds? That's, that's just unbelievable. I don't often swear in my videos, but I almost said, holy crap. Only, obviously, I would have used a different word instead of crap. Windows 98 distributed by Dell, so it's running the original installation, or at least an installation from Dell sanctioned media. Now just in case this machine does anything shocking, because I don't want to get in trouble on YouTube, I'm going to turn the video off and I'll bring things back after I've verified that there's nothing shocking on the screen and nothing personally identifiable like the previous owner's name. So, back in a flash! Okay, I'm back and we've reached the desktop. There's really nothing of any great interest on the desktop. And any information that is present on this computer will certainly be destroyed in short order. Although useful or interesting programs that do not have personally identifying information or confidential stuff associated with them, if I should find any, will certainly be saved. One thing I've noticed is that this machine is using the 48 by 48 icons perhaps suggesting that its owner was older, or maybe they just happened to like those other icons. Now we better go ahead and probably change this wallpaper because it wouldn't surprise me if the music... M music? <laughs> music and movie mafias, <laughs> try saying that a few times fast, would take this as an infringement of their rights and exhibit a complete lack of sense, lack of any sense of humor about the matter. This display does not appear to have any stuck pixels. It's almost certainly active matrix by the time this machine was made. Dual scan displays, passive matrix displays, both pretty much the same thing. Did enjoy a bit of a last gasp worth of popularity in the early 2000s in the form of a display model known as an HPA panel or high performance addressing. It tried to provide the cost savings of a dual scan passive matrix display while trying to make motion blurring a much less serious problem than it was. It wasn't too successful. I owned a machine like that back in the day, a compact Presario 1215. And while it was certainly better, it definitely had a significant amount of motion blurring, especially in gaming situations. This battery isn't real strong. It started out at 29% when I booted the machine and reached the desktop. Now it's dropped to 14 in just a couple of minutes. And it's just warned me to change to outlet power immediately. So that's probably going to curtail any exploration of the machine's software in great detail. It's pretty usual stuff though. WordPerfect, Microsoft Office, things like that. And what you're looking at right now is the battery model information if you're actually interested in that. Windows hasn't actually taken action against me yet. And although this is definitely in regular use, it certainly looks to have been maintained very well. There's not an overabundance of taskbar icons, and it started up pretty quickly. I guess we'll see how fast it manages to shut down. And then I'll find my power adapter, and we'll see if the optical drive actually happens to work, and if the battery happens to charge up. Shut down pretty quick, too. Okay, I didn't manage to come up with a Dell PA6, but I did come up with a PA9. And while it might be just a little tiny bit worse for the wear, 
it does seem to have more or less satisfied this machine that it is capable of charging the battery. So at least we've got a power connection and a little bit more room to play now. So I went ahead and got music CD, also got a video DVD that was in the furnace room. Yeah, it's a long story as to how it got in there too. <laughs> and as soon as this thing boots up, we'll see if it can play either one of those items. All right, I'm back once again, and we're definitely charging, but I got another heck of a shock. At first I thought, oh, you know, this has got to be a 1024 by 768 screen, and the large size of the icons threw me off. Oh, no. This thing's just amazing. Its previous owner must have just pulled out all the stops. 1280 by 1024. Holy cats! <laughs> Stop the presses, boys and girls. All right, so here's an audio CD. Let's go ahead and pop it in there, see what it does. Turn up the audio a little bit, or at least maybe turn it down and then turn it up so I don't get scared into the ceiling or something. I heard the drive get focus lock. The Windows is thinking about doing something, but is it going to do what I want it to do, which is bring up real joke box? <laughs> Now that's a blast from the past. <laughs> oh, I have a rule about never connecting unknown computers to my network, but it would really be tempting just to see if it could actually manage to pull down the artist and track information for that disc to this very day. Wow. <laughs> well, I really don't want to use real junk box to do this, so we'll go ahead and call up the good old Windows CD player see what that does for us and then we'll pick a track that looks interesting let's see here track number five let's see what we get I hear it playing make sure it's turned up here and there when I find myself in times of trouble Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. In my wow, that is surprisingly good fidelity for such tiny little speakers. Obviously that woofer thing inside the multi-drive bay is helping things out. Let's go ahead and swap this out for the DVD and see what that does. See if it actually manages to find it in its heart to play a DVD. Probably ought to close the CD player. Okay, it got focus lock. That's a good sign. Now, what's it going to present for a DVD player? Need some hold music or something. Interactual! What is it about software DVD players that they all think they have to reinvent their own interface that ends up being a million times worse than whatever conventional Windows programs would normally use? I don't know. It's not playing it. So let's see if it actually takes off and catches the hint here. Maybe. Now that's some deinterlacing, folks. <laughs> Wonder how we turn deinterlacing on in this program. I'll be back as soon as I figured it out. <laughs> Read that carefully. <laughs> All right, let me go ahead and figure out how to turn deinterlacing on, and I'll be back, and we'll have a little video sample. Okay, so I spent a couple minutes playing around with this, and I couldn't actually find an option to enable or de disable deinterlacing. I could certainly find options for everything else, from audio formats to closed captioning, but nothing for deinterlacing, which seems like a pretty serious fault for a DVD playback software package. So let's see what this does. I'll play the teaser first. Just like it. From now on, just call me 
suggested. Why would you want to look like him? It doesn't concern you. Stop. Get out of here. Oh, no! In the event that anyone's curious about this system's hardware roster, you can pause the video at this particular juncture to see whatever it is that happens to interest you. Here's the first screen of information. Here's another screen's worth of information. And there's the last of it, including an ESS Maestro audio solution. Speaking of that particular audio solution, here's a little demonstration of its synthesis capability. And now, in order to get this video wrapped up, a few closing observations. I did take a look at some of the dates on various files that were on this computer, though definitely not their contents, and it looks like the last time this system saw any regular use was back in early 2007, around January. That was the newest date that I found. If this thing has not seen AC power since January of 2007, and that battery still had just a tiny little bit of life left in it, that is impressive beyond words. This system is also equipped with a Synaptics touchpad and is another bit of proof that I do spend at least some of my time living in the past. It used to be that certain versions of the Synaptic touchpad drivers, well, their developer definitely had a sense of humor and I miss software like that because I always thought that special little things like Easter eggs and humorous commentary in certain portions of software programs well, to me, they showed that the people who worked on those things enjoyed what they were doing, and they really cared as well. And so it used to be that in certain versions of the Synaptic touchpad driver software, that you could practice scrolling through a list. And the list was entitled, Cheeses That I Have Known. And if you chose to activate the context-sensitive help and click on the item, the list of cheeses, it would tell you that you could practice scrolling in that area and then the developer or at least the author of the help file left a little footnote saying that they had not in fact actually known all of those cheeses. Well that's about it. I'm going to load some fresh software on this machine because it certainly seems that it would have some uses and it looks like this battery is actually coming up nicely in the short time that I've had it plugged in and been demonstrating it. But for now I'm out of videotape and pretty much out of things to say, so thank you everyone for watching, and as always, <laughs> that was certainly incongruent. I know it's the default, but it was incongruent. <laughs> thank you as always for watching, and by all means, certainly do feel free to leave a comment if you have one. And here's Windows 98 doing what it does best. Ramming one end of itself into the other and locking up! But there we go. It made it to shutdown. Even the hinges on this machine are still tight. Just amazing. <laughs>